Commissioner, the next witness is Tim Mullally. Yes, Mr Mullally. <laughs> Be good enough to come into the witness box, Mr. Mullally. Would you prefer to take an oath or make an affirmation? Make an affirmation. Yes. Um, witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Mullally. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Collinson. The Commissioner pleases. Um, your full name is Timothy Peter Mullaly? It is. And your business address uh, at ASIC is Level 7, 120 Collins Street, Melbourne? It is. And your position is presently Senior Executive Leader, Financial Services Enforcement Team at ASIC? That's correct. Now, you have a, a, an original of your summons to appear to give evidence before the Commission? I do. Uh, I'll tend to that. Commissioner. Exhibit 3.170, the summons to Mr Mullally. And secondly, Mr Mullally, you uh, have a copy there of your witness stated, statement dated 30 May 2018. I do. I'll tend to that. Exhibit 3.171 uh, is the statement of Mr Mullally and its exhibits. Thank you. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. So, is it Mr. Mullally or Mullally? Uh, it's either. I, I don't mind. <laughs> Not that particular. <laughs> I'll answer the both. I'll, I'll, I'll answer either. either. <laughs> All right. Now, Mr. Mullally, you've been the Senior Executive Leader of the ASIC Financial Services Enforcement Team since July of 2012. That's that right? correct. All right. And in that role, you're responsible for managing ASIC's enforcement investigations? in relation to financial services? Yes, just in relation to financial services. And that would include both licensed and unlicensed That's conduct? That's correct. All right. So, for example, if an unlicensed person is purporting to provide a financial service, you might be responsible for the enforcement proceeding against them? That's correct. And you're also responsible for ASIC's enforcement investigations in relation to financial services? That's correct. <coughs> Can I ask again, just out of curiosity, the, and tying back to module two, the issue of taking an unfair contract terms proceeding in respect of the contract between an advice licensee and a consumer, is that something that would fall within your ambit of responsibility? Yes. Do you know whether any consideration has been given to the application of the unfair contract terms regime to those types of contracts? I'm not aware that it has. You're not aware that it has, is that right? Yep, that's, right. that's what I said. Yes. Now you've, in your witness statement, set out some figures relating to proceedings and investigations that have been commenced by ASIC? That's correct. And. I'd like to go to that just so we can get a better sense of what they mean. So it's page nine of Mr Mullally's statement. That's ASIC.0800.0005.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001
That's correct. And is it right, or sh I should ask, does ASIC run those criminal proceedings itself, or are they conducted by the Director of Public Prosecutions? Um, th those particular proceedings will be conducted by um, the Director of Public Prosecutions. ASIC does, in another area of ASIC, run its own prosecutions in relation to um, reporting breaches and um, other um, books and records type breaches. All right. And then there's 277 civil proceedings? That's correct. And again, that could be under the ASIC Act, Corporations Act, NCCP Act, Insurance Act, and there was something else you mentioned? Well, it wouldn't be under State Crimes oh, Act. it wouldn't be under the no. State Crimes Act. All right. And then, and we'll come back to that in a moment, and then there's 587 administrative proceedings? That's correct. Could you just explain to the Commissioner what you mean by an administrative proceeding? Um, those administrative proceedings will be proceedings um, run by an ASIC delegate, um, so they'll be to um, ban people from various industries, whether it be credit or financial services, or it might be actions uh, against the licensee themselves to remove licences um, or to uh, uh, suspend licences or um, put conditions on licences. Um, and uh, it, I think, includes as well... Inf oh, sorry, it doesn't include infringement notices. That's separately run. And, sorry, does the 587 administrative proceedings, does that include the 370 infringement notices? No. That's something well, separate? Yes. And so, again, just so I make sure I've understood, an administrative proceeding doesn't mean going to a tribunal in order to have the tribunal make a decision, or it does? Um, it not, not an external tribunal, no. It's just an internal function that ASIC performs where there's a certain part of ASIC that has to determine whether or not to, for example, suspend somebody's licence. That's correct. All right. And then of those... Oh, I'm sorry, and then what you then explain at subparagraph C is... ASIC has issued 370 infringement notices. That's correct. With total, is it penalties? Is that how it's described? No, um, very much not penalties. ASIC has no ability to impose a penalty. Is it, what, how, how do you describe it, a fee? Um, well, sorry, I should say we do. Um, we describe it as uh, an infringement notice. Um, uh, I need to now to correct myself, penalty. It's not a penalty in the true sense of um, something uh, imposed by the court system. Yes. Um, and it's not a fine. And, and there's provision under the ASIC Act for ASIC to issue infringement notices for, and I'll summarise it as being, where ASIC has a reasonable belief that a contravention of certain provisions of the ASIC Act has occurred? That's correct. And are there also other statutory provisions in other acts that give ASIC the power to issue infringement notices? There is. All right. And so the 370 infringement notices would include both infringement notices issued under the ASIC Act and also infringement notices issued under other acts? That's correct. And then ASIC has accepted 194 enforceable undertakings? That's correct. Since 1 January 2008? Yes. And, and again, the enforceable undertakings, are they, what's the statutory regime that governs them? Well, in both the ASIC Act and in the Credit Act, there's a provision that enables ASIC to accept an enforceable undertaking offered by um, an entity. All right. And then in paragraph 29, you then move to specifically proceedings commenced in relation to contraventions of the ASIC Act. That's correct. And so that we can put this in some context, the ASIC Act contains the various consumer protection regimes that, or the consumer protection regime that ASIC administers? In relation to financial services, yes. And does that, there's various prohibitions on various things in the Corporations Act, which ASIC is also responsible for? That's correct. Does ASIC describe those as consumer protection or is that treated as something else? Um, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by treated as something else. Do, do you... There's something that you refer to concerned with market regulation? Well, ASIC has a um, very, very broad mandate. So ASIC 
uh, regulates the financial markets and financial market participants, ASIC regulates um, uh, auditors, it regulates liquidators, it regulates people from the financial services industry, regulates people from the credit industry, regulates superannuation trustees, regulates managed investment schemes, directors, etc. Um, so we take action, enforcement action, over a broad sort of mandate. Um, in a sense, all our work is aimed at protection of the um, consumers, uh, those are the consumers of um, the services provided by all those um, entities. Perhaps if we just try to, I'll use my favourite term, break it down, uh, if we could just break this down. Under the Corporations Act, that contains, for example, the provisions you referred to dealing with the with receivers, for example, and liquidators. Liquidators, yes. And it contains various provisions concerned with effectively the provision of market information or disclosure of information about financial products. There, there is provisions for that, yes. And when you're referring to regulation of superannuation trustees, is that under the Corporations Act or is that under the, a different act? Um, aspects will be under the Corporations Act, aspects will be under the ASIC Act and aspects will be under the SIS Act. All right. So what we're focused on then here in paragraph 29 is just proceedings that have been commenced under the ASIC Act. Yes. And you identify that since 1 January 2008, ASIC has commenced 110 proceedings alleging an ASIC Act contravention? Yes, or multiple contraventions. Yes, that, that's right. One proceeding might involve multiple contraventions. That's correct. And so that averages out at a bit over 10 a year. Is that right? That's, yes. And would that include a criminal proceeding or would that only be civil proceedings? Um, they would only be civil proceedings. Because there, are, there, there are, are criminal prohibitions under the ASIC Act. I'm just wondering whether that might be captured as well or you're not yes, sure. Yes, I'm not sure. All right. And then you break down of those 110, which relate to consumer protection breaches. That's and correct. Of the 110, 23 of the proceedings relate to what's defined as a consumer protection breach in section 12 GBB of the ASIC Act? That's correct. And I'll attempt to summarise what a consumer protection breach is as defined in 12 GBB, and then we'll see whether we agree on it. A consumer protection breach for the purposes of 12 GBB is one that is capable of attracting a civil pecuniary penalty. Is That's that right? correct. All right. And so, for example, a breach of the prohibition on unconscionable conduct is one that's capable of attracting a civil penalty. That's correct. So it would be captured as part of the consumer protection breach defined in 12 GBB? That's correct. And a, a contravention of 12 DB which relates to false or misleading representations as to particular types of things, for example, the price of services, that could also attract a civil pecuniary penalty? That's correct. And would therefore be caught within the definition of consumer protection? That's breach. my understanding, yes. And also a contravention of 12 capital D capital I, which has two types of prohibitions, but effectively prohibits receiving payment for financial services where either you're not intending to provide those financial services or you don't provide those financial services. That's also caught within the definition of consumer protection breach. That section is, whether it's described in that way, I, I couldn't say, but that section definitely is. 12, sorry. DI. Oh, I see. You, you couldn't say whether 12 DI is, As whether you explained I accurately it. No. described it. All right. Are you familiar with 12 DI? I certainly am. Okay. ASIC, just on that, that would be, we might say, the section relevant to fees for no service conduct? It's certainly agree? a section relevant to fees for no service conduct. And ASIC has never commenced a proceeding under 12 DI, is that no. right? And just to complete our very quick tour through the complicated provisions of the ASIC Act, 12 capital D capital A 
prohibits false or misleading conduct, oh, I'm sorry, misleading or deceptive conduct in relation to financial services? Yes. But that is not a consumer protection breach section, is that right? Uh, it doesn't attract a, a civil, pe a pecuniary penalty. Um, and on uh, what you've indicated in terms of 12 GBB, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think that's right. Um, whether it's caught a, up as a consumer protection breach, as you've described it, um, in other ways, I, I couldn't be certain. But yes, it doesn't attract a pecuniary penalty. All right. And, and perhaps just reflecting on the mo for a moment on the absence of any proceedings commenced alleging a contravention of 12 capital D capital I, is there a reason for that, do you think? Um, well, the reason is that we haven't had a matter where we've thought there's sufficient evidence for us to be able to bring an action under 12DI. All right. And then you see in paragraph 30, you say, in relation to the banks, since 1 January 2008, ASIC has obtained in excess of $700 million in compensation, remediation or return of funds to investors. That's correct. And I just want to make sure we understand what that number means. That's not... None of that is pecuniary penalties, is no, that right? No, that's, that's right. And that doesn't include the infringement notices amount? No. That's just ASIC has engaged with a financial services entity and the financial services entity has agreed to make compensation or remediation, is that right? That's correct. Would there be some circumstances in which ASIC has commenced and succeeded in a court action and obtained orders for, that are effectively provide for remediation? Sorry, could you ask that question again? Yes, so would there, in some, ASIC obviously has commenced some civil proceedings under the ASIC Act, and it presumably in some of those proceedings seeks orders for redress in relation to consumers? That's correct. Do you know whether the $700 million includes monies that have been paid pursuant to a redress order? I, I'm fairly certain that it, it doesn't include any monies in that. All right. So can you, can you yes. excuse me for a minute? <coughs> Thank you. And then it's also obtained $54.3 million in community benefit payments? That's correct. And community benefit payments are the donations that banks will agree to make, financial services entities will agree to make when they give an enforceable undertaking? Um, yes, it's, it's um, equivalent in a sense to a community service type order that the, the courts can order under section 12 GLA. Um, however, um, we uh, seek to obtain those or agree those through uh, generally enforceable undertakings. Sometimes they're offered without uh, an enforceable undertaking being required. I see, and that was the next thing I was going to ask you. Sometimes in order to resolve a moment of tension with ASIC, a financial services entity will agree to make a donation to, to something? I, I, I'm not sure that I would say to resolve a moment of tension is an apt description. Or perhaps would you say to resolve an investigation that's being undertaken? Well, I, I'm not sure that even to resolve an investigation, it seems that that's suggesting that a payment can make something go away and, and that's obviously not the case. Well, I, I'm just trying to understand, when, when you say you've obtained $54.3 million in community benefit payments, and some of that has come from commitments that are made under enforceable undertakings, some of that is made voluntarily, is that right? Um, some, uh, yes, that's correct. So, for example, Westpac, in the context of an issue about responsible lending, agreed to make a donation of $1 million to something? You're not sure? Uh, it's quite possible, but I would need to see something or about the specifics. But I, I just want to understand the point you're making, which is a bank might agree to make the donation, but that's not necessarily a resolution of the situation. With, I, I'm using the word tension, I think, you yes, know, and I, then investigation, but we're, you weren't comfortable yes, with either of those. Yes. Can you just... well, generally, we will have an investigation underway into particular issues uh, involving uh, an entity, um, and the, res uh, the, the manner in which um, we finalise that investigation um, may include a range of um, actions by that other 
um, entity or person on the other side. Um, so perhaps if I'm able to um, explain by way of um, examples, we might accept an enforceable undertaking. That enforceable undertaking will have a number of things that the offerer has to do. Um, and part of that might be as well payment of a community benefit payment. Um, we may decide that we'll um, finalise a matter in a very similar way, but do it without the need for an enforceable undertaking. So there will be offers made of changing conduct or to do certain things. And um, along with that is also an offer to pay a community benefit payment. Perhaps if I show you an example, which I think, I hope, will illustrate the point you're trying to make. Can we bring up RCD? dot triple zero six dot triple zero four dot zero zero one zero so this is what I was referring to before which is a I'm not sure whether I should use the word resolution or whether you would be uncomfortable with that. No, I think it was perhaps perhaps I read something into a that I shouldn't have, so I apologise if I have. I used the expression moment of tension. Mm. Was that the point of concern? I, well, that did seem to suggest that, you know, in a moment of peak, something will happen, and I'm, I'm not sure that that oh, characterises no, no, the I, way I was, in which these things operate. No, I, I apologise. That certainly wasn't what I was implying. I was attempting to find a way to describe a situation in which there is a disagreement between ASIC and the relevant yes. regulated entity, but there's no... There's no enforceable undertaking. There's no proceeding that's yes. been commenced. There's just a, a disagreement. Yes. And, or a concern, I think, might be the way we should express it, given this document. So this is a media release by Westpac. Commissioner, you might recall in the first round of hearings, there was a case study that was concerned with this conduct. So as we understand it, there was a concern of ASIC about the circumstances in which Westpac was providing credit li card limit increases? That appears to be the case, yes. Do you recall this particular I, case? I, I do in, in very general terms. It's a matter that wasn't um, within my team. All right. All I see was dealt with by a different team. Yes, as I understand. My recollection is that this was dealt with by Mr Sadat's team. I see. Oh, it, it didn't reach the point of of coming to enforcement, is that? Um, I, I'd need as to... As you can recall. I, I'm not trying to trick you. I just, yes, there's... there's I, I simply can't recall. All right. But this is the type of resolution that you're talking about, which is ASIC would, had a concern about Westpac's provision of credit card limit increases, and Westpac agreed to improve its practices and then committed to a remediation program and agreed to donate $1 million over four years to support financial counselling and literacy. That's correct. And then that would, that would that result in a resolution of the We'd issue? would finalise that particular matter with ASIC, yes. All right, I tend to that document, Commissioner. ASIC Media Release 16-009MR RCD 0060040010 becomes Exhibit 3.172. Thank you, Commissioner. And then if we move to paragraph 31 of your statement, so we go back to ASIC.0800.0005.0010. And go to 0010. The, if you look at paragraph 31, this is now where you're referring specifically to what proceedings have been commenced against the banks. And I should be, we should be clear about this. We, that is the Royal Commission, gave you a particular definition of the banks, which was the Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, ANZ, NAB, Bank of Queensland and Suncorp, or entities related to them. That's correct. And so you're referring here to proceedings commenced by ASIC against those six entities or entities related to them? Yes, that's correct. And you've identified that in the last ten and a half, or almost ten and a half years, ASIC has commenced ten proceedings that's against those entities? 
and five of those allege a contravention of the ASIC Act? That's correct. And of those five, four of them are the BBSW cases? That's correct. And one of them is the case against Bank of Queensland in respect of Storm Financial? That's correct. And I may be testing you now, but I just want to see if we can figure out what the other five are. One of them, I suspect, is that ASIC commenced a proceeding against Commonwealth Bank in relation to Storm, and then it was resolved? That's correct. Is that one of those five? Yes. And then another was that ASIC, in the last year or so, commenced a proceeding against ANZ in relation to a Sander car finance? That's correct. And that was in relation to responsible lending? That's correct. And that was resolved earlier this year with a agreed civil penalty of $5 million? That's correct. And a third case is that ASIC commenced a proceeding against some Westpac-related entities in relation to a failure to comply with the best interests duty where the Westpac entities were running a telephone campaign to, I'm sorry, it's alleged, I should say alleged because I'm not sure this is reserved at the moment. It's reserved. In this case. The Westpac entities were running a telephone campaign, or alleged to be running a telephone campaign to recommend people switch their superannuation to Westpac superannuation funds? But, well, generally, yes, that's correct. That's sort of a rough summary yes. of the allegations. Yes. And that case, that was commenced in the federal court and is reserved at that's the moment. That's correct. A fourth case is that ASIC has commenced a proceeding against, another proceeding against Westpac, alleging a failure to comply with responsible lending that's obligations. Correct. And that's a case set down for a hearing at the end of the year or in uh, the second half of the year? Uh, yes, I think there's a, a date set for trial now. And then, do you know what the fifth proceeding is? I might be testing you now. Uh, I think there might have been a second one against Bank of Queensland um, in relation to Storm. I see. But that second proceeding didn't involve contraventions of the ASIC That's Act. correct. Thank you. And then... If we then go over the page to page 12. <coughs> we see at the bottom of the page, ASIC has issued 45 infringement notices to the banks, again using our definition, totaling $2.1 million. That's correct. And if we then go over the page again to page 13, we can see what those are. That's correct. Can I ask a question just about the CBA one, which is the six infringement notices? Is that is that figure definitely right? Is it one million or should it be one hundred eighty thousand dollars? I I would have to look. It it does. Now that I look at it, it does look um, a little bit out of place. Yes, I wondered. I'm not sure we have it here. I just have a feeling that that might be might have an extra zero in the middle of it. Now, and the, again, I'll test you. Was that in relation to automated responsible lending, do you recall? Does that assist? I, I believe that it was. All right. I'd, yes, I don't, I, I've got the, your media release from the 14th of September 2016, but I, unfortunately I don't have a document ID on it. But in any event, so if that's, if that's the case, Rather than $2.125 million, it might be something a bit lower than that. Is that right? That, that'd be correct. And a number of these infringement notices are not contraventions of the ASIC Act. They are... Sorry, actually, I should withdraw that. None of them are strictly contraventions of the Act. They're infringement notices issued on the premise that, a, that ASIC has a reasonable belief that there's a contravention. That's that? correct. And in paying an infringement notice, the payer doesn't have to or doesn't admit that there's been a contravention. Is that it's, right? It's not an admission of contravention. And a number of these infringement notices are infringement notices issued in relation to what I, I might term 
market conduct under the Corporations Act, things like failure to comply with the continuous disclosure rules, an infringement notice issued by the market's disciplinary panel, breach of derivative transactions reporting, <coughs> that sort of thing. That's correct. All right. And so of these various infringement notices that you've identified here, in, I think you've explained in paragraph 34, ASIC had reasonable grounds to believe that a person had contravened subdivision D of division two of part two of the ASIC Act, which relates to consumer protection when issuing six notices? Six infringement notices, yes. And had reasonable grounds to believe that a person had contravened section 12, capital D, capital B, which is the prohibition on false or misleading representations when issuing three notices, is that right? That's correct. All right. Now, I want to then explore with you, having understood these numbers, the approach that ASIC takes to deciding whether or not to pursue a court proceeding or an infringement notice and how that decision is made. And I wonder if we might do this by reference to one example. Can we bring up RCD.0006.0004.0004? So this is a press release from September of 2014. This is one of the sets of infringement notices that you were referring to in your statement? Yes. And this is an infringement notice to NAB for misleading Eubank advertisements? Yes. And the penalty, I'm sorry, the contravention that ASIC reasonably believes has in has occurred is a contravention of the prohibition on false or misleading representations? That's correct. And the penalty, it says penalty, uh, we, yes. anyway, the amount that's paid pursuant to the infringement notice by the NAB is $40,800? That's correct. Now, presumably, ha and that I should say, or we should be clear about this, there were four infringement notices issued, each of them was for $10,200. That's right, I believe. And presumably, had ASIC taken a proceeding against NAB to court and sought a pecuniary penalty against NAB for the misleading advertisements, it would have sought a pecuniary penalty that was exponentially more than the amount of the infringement notices. That's correct. And can you explain to the Commissioner then what's the process by which a decision is made to stick with an infringement notice rather than seeking a pecuniary penalty? Uh, well, we consider the nature of the conduct um, and the seriousness of the conduct. Um, we consider whether or not um, there was a deliberate um, attempt or a dishonest attempt to break the law or whether there was inadvertence. Um, we consider the cooperation of the entity um, in seeking to finalise and resolve the matter with ASIC. Um, and we consider what might be the market impact of that particular conduct. Um, we also consider our resourcing um, priorities and implications of um, one form of action over another. Um, and so all of that is considered. Um, and we go through a process of recommendations by the team through me as the senior executive to the commission and make a decision as uh, whether um, infringement notices are the appropriate outcome. And, and do you recall having been involved in this particular decision? I, I'm, I think I was involved in this decision, yes. And one of the things that the deputy chairman is quoted as saying is, ASIC's crackdown on misleading advertising has seen action taken against 10 entities this year. ASIC will continue to take action where we believe firms have not provided clear, consistent information in their advertising. I could say that, yes. And do you recall, does that reflect a particular priority that ASIC had either 
at that time or in general to crack down on misleading advertising? ASIC, um, around that time or, or slightly before, um, we determined that we, we hadn't been using the infringement notice um, powers that we had available to us um, and we determined that we would start using them more in the context of advertising. I see. And I'm just trying to understand, and you may not be able to help us, why not commence a court proceeding against NAB and seek a pecuniary penalty? Um, well, I, I, at, at this stage, I can't recall all the facts and circumstances around it, but as I say, I, I think we would have gone through that sort of essential synthesis of information and determined that the appropriate outcome in relation to that particular matter was um, the issuing of infringement notices. And I wonder, has there been any change that you've observed over the course of the last two or three years in ASIC in terms of its appetite to commence civil proceedings seeking pecuniary penalties against entities for contraventions of the consumer protection legislation? Um, there hasn't been a significant um, uptick in the amount of action, civil penalty action that you've just mentioned. Does ASIC have a view about whether it is preferable for it to pursue court proceedings against larger entities? Um, it, it's not as simple as we will prefer to take action against larger entities. It, it depends on the particular max, mat, sorry, particular facts of each matter. Um, certainly, one of the um, cri or considerations that we give to both commencing investigation, but also to the type of outcome that we'll seek is whether that outcome will have an, an impact on the market, whether it will change behaviour, um, both specifically and more generally. Does ASIC recognise that obtaining declarations and pecuniary penalties from the federal court is a significantly greater deterrent when compared with infringement notices and enforceable undertakings? Um, we we recognise that it certainly is a deterrent. Um, in some respects, I think um, there's evidence to be obtained around um, whether or not particularly enforceable undertakings have a... Um, a, a or, or the, uh, the amount or nature of the general deterrence message that is um, proffered by an enforceable undertaking. But we, we recognise that having the courts determine these issues is uh, a matter which is significant and, and sends a message to the market, definitely. Do you accept that if you went to court and obtained declarations of contraventions against one of the large banks of the consumer protection legislation and obtained a pecuniary penalty against that entity, that that would have significantly greater general deterrent effect than reaching an enforceable undertaking with that entity? Um, again, I, I, I think there's evidence to be um, sought in relation to that as to the general deterrent effect and specific deterrent, but more um, appropriately for this, the general deterrent effect of enforceable undertakings. And ASIC is, in fact, funding um, uh, research in relation to that, acad academic research in relation to that. Um, but I take, I, I don't argue with the point that a determination by the court um, provides a very strong general deterrent message. Um, and ASIC brings civil penalty cases before the federal court on a regular basis. Well, uh, and let's just be clear about what that means. You, you mean not just under the ASIC Act, under other acts? Under ASIC brings enforcement action um, through the court system, you know, essentially once a week for the last 10 years. Let's just see if that works. Sorry, did you say civil enforcement action? No, I said enforcement action through the courts. So ASIC... ASIC brings action, and I think 
that's set out in my statement, um, 238 criminal proceedings and 277 civil proceedings over the last 10 and a half years. Yes. We, we use, utilise the court system um, significantly. Yes, this is page... I'm sorry, I should just tend to that media release, Commissioner, which I haven't done. That's rcd.0006. ASIC media release 14-235 uh, MR RCD double, uh, treble 06, treble 04, treble 04, exhibit 3.173. And so if we go back to ASIC.0800.0005.0010. And go to page dot zero zero one zero. So just so the commissioner is clear on what you're talking about, when you say approximately once a week, that's the sum of the two hundred and thirty eight criminal proceedings and two hundred and seventy seven civil proceedings. That's that correct. Right? And the 238 criminal proceedings, they would be proceedings conducted by the Director of Public Prosecutions, I think you said. They're, they're prosecutions conducted by the DPP on a but referral from ASIC. Of, from ASIC after an investigation by ASIC, yes. And then the civil proceedings would be proceedings under, as we've identified, a number of different acts. That's correct. All right. And w would that include bringing a proceeding to seek a disqualification order against a director, for example? Um, not all of those actions would be caught up in that because, as I um, perhaps didn't indicate clearly enough, we have a, a small business and compliance deterrence team that brings a lot of actions in relation to um, uh, proceedings against companies, also I think against directors as well. Um, but certainly there would be some uh, proceedings uh, for disqualification of directors caught up in those proceedings. Do you... In terms of your running of the team, have you observed any change in the appetite for bringing responsible lending cases against the big four banks? Um, well, we have a proceeding on foot at the moment in relation to Westpac Bank. Um, is a change in appetite. Um, uh, I think from an enforcement perspective, we're always looking to um, seek the, the right or the best outcome in our judgment um, in relation to any matter. If we think it is um, necessary to bring a court action for responsible lending, then you know, we will do so. And I think our action in relation to Westpac, which is um, filed, so allegations at this stage, um, in relation to a sander, um, and even more recently, but not bank-related in relation to Thorn, um, you know, we've brought those actions and through the court system. And just in relation to a Sander, that was another responsible lending case? It was, right? yes. And ANZ agreed in that case to pay a pecuniary penalty of $5 million? That's correct. And was there a reason... Oh, I'm sorry, I should ask, were you involved in the decision as to whether you did that by infringement notice or court proceeding? Um, I was certainly involved in that decision-making process. And can you explain to the Commissioner, so why in that case, why go with a court proceeding seeking a pecuniary penalty rather than an infringement notice? Um, the, that particular proceeding arose out of um, uh, uh, some other investigations that we undertook in relation to um, false loan applications, um, particularly in the motor vehicle industry. Um, so we saw quite a lot of this occurring, um, and in particular in relation to a particular matter in Western Australia. Um, and we took the view that um, it was important not just to take action against um, those car dealerships, um, or uh, mortgage brokers, sorry, not mortgage brokers, um, <coughs> loan brokers um, that were involved, but also to say, hang on a sec, what's happening at the bank end? Are they doing their job properly to try and stop this type of behaviour? So um, we looked at what was happening at the bank end and consider, considered that there was a, a failure in relation to um, the responsible lending obligations and therefore determined that the best way to resolve that matter was through a court outcome. 
Perhaps I'll just ask you one other thing, and that is, does ASIC have a view or a policy about whether it would prefer an enforcement approach to an engagement approach? Sorry, I'm sorry. So in dealing with, in dealing with the banks or other financial services entities, there are different ways that ASIC might deal with them. It might take an enforcement approach where what it's at, at the minimum what it's contemplating is an infringement notice and at the maximum what it's contemplating is a court proceeding. Or it might take an engagement approach where it's involved in negotiation with them and that might tend to preference towards either no enforcement outcome or something short of an enforcement outcome. Does ASIC have a view, as you understand it, between those two? I, I, I don't think ASIC has a preference for one or the other. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Yes. Mr Mullally. Other parties seek leave. Yes, Mr Collinson. Uh, if I can give some evidence from the bar table, uh, Commissioner, um, I'm instructed that on page 13 of Mr Mullally's statement, um, the figure is $180,000 uh, for CBA in the second last entry. Uh, and actually the figure six is apparently incorrect. I'm instructed it should be four. Well, if Mr Mullally's uh, content to uh, adopt that, uh, we can have the exhibit changed. But Mr Mullally, that's putting you on the spot. Um, uh, well, I, I'll take it from both uh, our council assisting and my council that it's uh, four and 180,000. Yeah. Are you happy to make that change? I'll make that change. Perhaps Perhaps if we, uh, have you got the original exhibit or who has the original exhibit? Uh, I've got the original statement If here. you could be good enough to Total make the amendments. Um, oh, yes. Yes, I'm not in a position to give you just the uh, total amount at the bottom. Yeah, just a moment then, Mr Mullally. What changes are we making? Uh, my learned friends uh, kindly pointed out, uh, Commissioner, that the change from a million and eighty to one hundred and eighty thousand dollars will affect arithmetically the total at the bottom. Yes. I don't have that figure just at this this moment. Can, can I, well, it will decrease by nine hundred thousand dollars, so it means it should be two thousand two hundred and twenty-five dollars and nine hundred and fifty cents. Is that helpful to you? If you just change, uh, I'm sorry, one million two hundred and twenty-five. If you could just a little bit slower, thanks. Yes. So, you see the total. You've got forty-five. Yes. That's going to drop to forty-three. I'm sorry. I'm now leading your. <laughs> <laughs> Where you go? I have to close sometime this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> So it should be 43 yes. and the total should be $1,225,950. That's assuming there's no other changes. Apologies for that. That's right. Uh, Mr Mullaly, just a couple of points. Um, you say in your statement that uh, ASIC hasn't uh, conducted any proceedings in respect of section 12D, capital I of the ASIC Act? That's correct. And um, my friend um, almost always gets everything right, but um, in this respect, when he referred to section 12DI, I think he said there were two limbs, uh, the first of which is where the person uh, intends not to, to supply the service. And I think he described the second limb uh, as a case where the service is in fact not provided. Um, I don't think we need to go to the section, but it, it, it's in the gist of it is for the second limb that at the time of acceptance there are reasonable grounds for believing that the person will not be able to supply the financial services within the period specified by the person or if no period is specified within a reasonable time. Um, that's just a preliminary to my question, which is. Um, has, I don't, don't, don't say what the advice is, but do you know whether ASIC has obtained external advice from council as to the proper construction of section 12D capital I? We have. Yeah. Would uh, that it, consider the case of uh, charging someone's estate for provision uh, <coughs> of a service to the deceased? Uh, not specifically, Commissioner. Um, my second question was, uh, 
you were asked some questions about enforceable undertakings, um, and uh, I want to ask you this. Uh, have there been instances where ASIC uh, has um, resolved a proceeding against a party on the basis of both an enforceable undertaking and a civil penalty order? Yes, we have. Are you able to say how common that is? Um, it's not infre uh, Sorry, it's not frequent. Um, uh, I couldn't say how many times we've done it, but I think um, the BBSW matters are matters where that's occurred. I think in very recent responsible lending matter of Thorn, there was both civil penalty and uh, enforceable undertaking, um, and I'm sure that there'll be other examples as well. Are you able to summarise for the Commissioner what the advantages of an enforceable undertaking are? Well, it's certainly in respect of changes to internal processes, compliance processes. Um, those are things why that why is that? Well, we're able to get agreement um, with uh, the entity providing the um, enforceable undertaking. Um, we can be quite specific about what it is that we would like um, changed in terms of those compliance processes. Um, we're able to um, get independent oversight in relation to that and then, in a sense, a follow-up as well. So if an independent expert um, makes recommendations that further changes are required under the enforceable undertaking, um, that's what will generally occur. Those, those additional um, changes are made, something that's a little bit harder to get under an administrative proceeding. And what's the consequence of a breach of a, an enforceable undertaking? Um, it's enforceable by ASIC through the courts. Um, Melinda Friend asked you some questions, uh, or a question, uh, about whether ASIC has given any consideration to reliance upon the UCT laws in the context of a financial advice licensee. That's correct. And uh, if people would permit me, can I just jog your memory about a possibility? Um, uh, ASIC against Cobelt, K-O-B-E-L-T. Do you have any recollection about whether any consideration was given to that subject matter in that context? Yes, it was. In what respect? Are you able to elaborate? Um, well, I, I'll say that um, Mr Cobalt, uh, well, first of all, that case is subject to a special leave application yes. to the High Court at the moment. Um, and uh, well, you say the better, perhaps. Well, yes, that's that's the first thing. The second is that Mr. Cobalt's not a financial services provider, which is my response to that particular question. Um, however, in relation to that matter, we considered whether, uh, or we considered issues around unfair contract terms. However, what we found in that case was. Um, the conduct also amounted to, or we allege that it amounts to unconscionable conduct, and we're able to get far significant outcomes, I think, in terms of um, court process um, going by, by pleading an a, um, unconscionable conduct case. Thank you. My last question is, um, as you know, your statement says in paragraph 30 that in the period uh, since January 2008, ASIC has obtained... Uh, in excess of $700 million in compensation from, from the banks. Uh, does that mean just the banks that were nominated by ASIC or, or the banking sector more broadly? Uh, well, it's the... No, those are the banks that... Um, asked about. Were, oh, I'm sorry, ASIC was asked, asked about. about. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. That's, that's yes. correct. Um, so just, the figure um, is would be larger than that, yes. Yes. Are, are you able to just assist with the Commissioner with what... Uh, I, the, the enforcement team that you're in charge of has an annual budget or annual spend on enforcement? Uh, well, it does, yes. Yes. And uh, do you know what the average spend on uh, proceedings against the banks has been in the last three years? Um, not on proceedings and, and not specifically in relation to my budget. Uh, you know, I, I simply don't have that figure at hand, but what I can say is that um, over the last three years, um, about 25% of ASIC's enforcement budget, perhaps a, a touch higher, has been spent um, uh, on investigations and enforcement action in relation to the banks. And by banks, do you there mean a uh, wider group than just the banks uh, that the Commission asked about? Generally, it'll be uh, the big four, so ANZ, CBA, NAB, Westpac, 
Um, however, it also includes AMP and Macquarie in terms of our wealth management project. Yes. No further questions. Okay. Mr. Hodge. Nothing arising, Commissioner. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maloney. You may step down and you are excused. Commissioner, that concludes the case study. Could I ask, could we adjourn until 2 p.m. and then Two. close then? Yes. We'll resume sitting at 2 p.m. Thank you.